Hello, I'm Tino Cuellar, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Water keeps us alive and sustains our planet, but often it also tells a story. In my home state of California, you can trace most of our history by seeing the story of the infrastructure built to move water from Highland East to Coastal West, from greener north to the parched south where I was a kid growing up. Now, drought and climate change are restricting access to clean water supplies all over the world to different extents and different degrees. In North Africa and the Middle East, fresh water is a vital resource as tens of millions in the region have to deal with the risks of water scarcity. In 2019, Chennai's residents in India woke up to find that there was nearly no water in their city's reservoirs. In Mexico City and other parts of Latin America, regions of North America, water scarcity is a reality. In fact, a third of all countries experience moderate or high levels of water stress right now. Globally, the water crisis can drive or worsen conflict, like the dispute over the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that's entangling Ethiopia and Egypt and Sudan, like the border scrimmages between India and China over the Brahmaputra River. Already, climate refugees are beginning to leave their native lands due to water shortages and its impact on food availability and agriculture. And climate is likely to worsen the impacts of water scarcity and global security and development in the next few years. Meanwhile, of course, the world struggles to deal with familiar geopolitical risks from nuclear weapons, from conflicts like the tragedy in Ukraine, from climate change that can create massive flooding in some regions and scarcity elsewhere, and from changes in the biosphere. Amidst all that, it's worth remembering that about 70% of our world may be covered with water, but fresh water is an incredibly fragile resource. It's only 3% of the water in the world, and two-thirds of that is stored in glaciers or otherwise unavailable for use. Here at the Carnegie Endowment, our purpose is to understand and help the world do something sensible about the issues that can drive fissures into the peaceful relationships of countries and spur conflict. On the eve of World Water Day, we gather to acknowledge how much water scarcity can complicate geopolitics and threaten well-being. But we'll also explore what the story of water scarcity now tells us about how the world can cooperate and achieve peace and what might determine whether our generation is able to give our kids and their descendants a running start in meeting the water needs of the world. We have a stellar panel to help us understand the crisis, its future, and how we might reverse the most troubling trends. I'm pleased to welcome Ellen Hanuk, uh, who is Vice President, Director, and Senior Fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California Water Policy Center, where she holds the Hanuk Chair in Water Policy. Welcome, Ellen. I have Olivia Lazard, my colleague at Carnegie, who's a scholar at Carnegie Europe, whose research focuses on the geopolitics of climate change. Stuart Patrick joins us. He's the James Binger Senior Fellow in Global Governance and Director of the International Institutions and Global Governance Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Zena Busman is a Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. Welcome, all of you, and thank you for joining us. So let's start with the basics. Let me ask you, Ellen, what is water scarcity and why does it matter? This is a really good question. And I, I was thinking about it a little bit. It, you know, we think about water scarcity, it's not having enough. And there are dry places where we wouldn't be focusing on saying it's a water scarce place because there also aren't people competing over it. It's really where water scarcity really comes up as an idea is when you have competition over the resource um, in ways that really really can engender conflict. And that can happen either because the climate is changing, as you pointed out, Tino. It can happen because folks have been using groundwater reserves more than is being replenished. And so there's a long-term decline in the, in the resources. And it can happen because of population growth and just a growing demand for the water. And all of those things are leading to, to conflicts in, in different parts of the world. Terrific. Thank you. We'll talk more about all of this. But let me go to Stuart for a moment and ask you to just share with us what you take to be some of the geopolitical consequences of water scarcity and how that scarcity can impact human development and conflict potentially. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tino. Um, a couple of points just to pick up on what Ellen said. You know, uh, she said a lot of this was a story of demography. Um, and one of the issues here is that humans, um, uh, well, fresh water is finite uh, and humans are anything but having increased uh, over 30 folds uh, over the last 2000 years, whereas water has stayed the same. Um, 
But moving to geopolitics, um, the, there's no question that the salience of water is rising and nations are increasingly using control over water resources as leverage. And we'll, undoubtedly, we'll talk about a number of flashpoints this morning, but one of the most dangerous that I find is between nuclear armed China and India over several rivers that are originating in the China in China or the Tibetan Plateau, including the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra, which really give a chokehold, um, uh, China, a chokehold on India's um, economy and water access. And we've already seen, just to use a couple of examples, that, that China's diverted water during periods of tension and plans actually permanently to divert um, more water to its parched north, which would affect 140 million people downstream. So obviously huge geopolitical implications because these are two very, um, you know, the two most populous nations in the world with more than a quarter of the world's population. It's volatile because there's no water sharing agreement between the two countries. Um, there's, it's taking place in the context of just rapidly changing glacial melting and precipitation and increased uh, Chinese water insecurity. Um, uh, finally, I, I do want to say something on, on water and violent conflict. Um, I think here it's important to take a nuanced position. You know, there's been a lot of warnings over the years of the coming water wars, but I think it's important for us to recognize that both at the interstate level and also internally, there's huge number of, there are a huge number of intervening variables uh, between, you know, the fact that water is scarce and people are actually engaging in bloodletting. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, though there's there's an increasing sense that um, that even though the evidence to date is that countries rarely come to blows over water, um, despite the fact that there are all these uh, shared river basins and shared aquifers, you know there, there's a, a sense that maybe climate change is making things different this time. And even though political scientists haven't been able to find much correlation in the past, that as they say in investment prospectuses, that uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. And so strategists around the world are looking increasingly at water as a, as a major source of contention. And we'll talk more about this, Stuart, but right now, just to give us a sense of what possible futures you imagine around China, India, as they struggle to come to terms with the reality that they both depend on a finite resource, in effect. Something yeah. familiar for me, Growing up in right on the border between the U.S. and Mexico with the Colorado River and the, Ellen knows all about this sort of flows down and ends up in a not in a position to come anywhere near meeting all the needs that are um, that people depend on it for. But so, like, give us a sense of how you can imagine that China India dynamic playing out over 10, 20 years in either a positive or very negative direction. Yeah, I mean, the, the difficult, I mean, in a, a positive direction would be going into trying to negotiate some sort of a water sharing agreement that maybe taking a page from the nuclear weapons um, uh, ish, um, sphere where you have sort of confidence building mechanisms. Because right now, not only is there no water sharing agreement, but during times of, of strife when, you know, there's 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 big battles over, um, over lines of control um, in the Himalayas, um, the the, the Chinese have ceased sharing actually information on water flows, which makes it almost impossible for the downstream riparian countries um, to actually adjust because they don't know when, if it's going to be flooded or not, um, or, or, or if they're going to be actually deprived of um, the silt that is so important for the, the Ganges and other uh, river deltas um, in India. So you could imagine things deteriorating um, quite strongly, particularly since the agricultural lobby is so massive in India and it has such a political, such, such a important uh, political resonance uh, over, <clears throat> over the BJP government. So you could imagine uh, things escalating to such a degree that, that there would be demands amongst the Indian public for retaliation over this sort of thing. And the only real retaliation that the Indians could probably um, embark on would be something military that you would start out as a limited strike, but could quickly escalate. So there are a number of different scenarios one could imagine uh, that are not, uh, that wouldn't have a pretty result. Thank you. Zainab, of course, these dynamics, maybe not exactly the same, but similar in terms of competition, disagreement about water resources are also playing out in Africa. Tell us a little bit about how this is connected to disputes over the Great Ethiopian Renaissance team. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Tino. And I'm so glad we're having uh, this event to commemorate World Water Day. Indeed, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, water is such a vital resource. Uh, its scarcity 
issues around access to it uh, are absolutely important, uh, but unfortunately, they have not received as much coverage as other kinds of uh, challenges around access to natural resources, whether oil or gas or mineral resources or even agriculture resources. Uh, so this is you know, a very, very important discussion we're having today. Uh, when it comes to Africa, um, we are seeing uh, some major flashpoints, as you rightly mentioned, the uh, issues and I think perhaps the tensions around the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam uh, come to mind. And, uh, and those reflect really ways in which uh, we're seeing water scarcity play out into interstate tensions. But before we even get into issues around the dam itself, uh, at the heart of it is um, we're seeing disputes around uh, access to uh, the resources around the Nile Basin, right? So there are tensions over access to and rights over the Nile water resources among the um, 11 riparian countries, including Egypt, the Sudans, and Ethiopia, but also other countries, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and so on. Um, and, and, and we've seen efforts to try to manage these relations, these tensions among these countries, but they have not really yielded results yet, because at the heart of it, um, there are also historical and legacy issues where um, colonial era treaties, um, have uh, created some kind of imbalance in terms of uh, you know, the access to these resources by upstream countries and also by downstream countries, right? Then which then brings us to the dam itself. Uh, you know, Ethiopia came up with this idea of building the dam to address its electricity access challenges, which then provoked uh, 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 intense uh, opposition from downstream countries like Egypt in particular, but also Sudan to an extent. And you know, this has been there's been a bit of back and forth. The UN has been involved, the African Union, the you know, Gulf Arab countries, a lot of other divergent interests are coming into play. And finally, uh, in February this year, Ethiopia began producing electricity from the dam. And it has become such a national project of pride because unlike other major infrastructure projects in Ethiopia, this one was actually funded by the Ethiopian people. So civil servants, for example, gave parts of their salaries. The Ethiopian government uh, floated bonds to finance the dam. So this is something that is still ongoing and it represents a very important flashpoint uh, uh, in terms of competition, tensions, and potentially conflict over access to uh, water resources. We'll come back to this, but Olivia, what does this tell us about the way we could imagine conflict over water playing out over time and what useful productive role might countries that have resources to support development or governance reforms play in this process. Thank you, Tino, and I'm very glad to be here. I think that the very first thing that we need to understand about water in a climate disrupted world is that we need to understand it as a self-standing resource, obviously, but also as a resource which comes from interdependencies with other ecological systems, particularly soils and biodiversity. And if I rebound back from what Zainab was saying about uh, the GERD issue um, and the conflicts that we're looking at between Ethiopia and downstream and riparian countries, um, we need to understand that this is a tip of the iceberg. We're looking very much and focusing on the watershed of the Nile Basin, but we also need to understand where the source of the Nile comes from and takes its root. So obviously the, the root of the Nile takes place in the Ethiopian highlands, but the rainfall patterns themselves falling onto Ethiopian highlands come from the Congo Basin. And the more deforestation we actually see in the Congo Basin, which is currently extremely active because of various issues such as armed conflict, um, in which timber is, you know, part and parcel of conflict economies, development pathways or infrastructure development, which are not very conscious or aware of hydrological pathways, the more we're going to see essentially disruptions of rainfall patterns that are not just attributable to climate change per se, but very much attributable to anthropogenic activities and the sort of cutting down and, uh, and uh, active weakening of ecological dependencies and ecological integrities. So in a world where uh, 
water scarcity or uh, water is going to become scarcer, either because of climate change or because of anthropogenic activity, we actually need to shift gears in terms of how we look at water cooperation, development and infrastructure planning, and governance planning as a whole. And we need to actually be able to map out uh, in very visual terms, where the ecological interdependencies between different regions are so that we strengthen atmospheric rivers that distribute water all across the globe and so that we ensure essentially the ability of any landscape to retain water and to strengthen what we call the hydrological cycle. So this, this movement of water from liquid to gas and back to liquid. Um, and in you know the world that we're entering, we very much need to sort of look at cooperation or negotiations over watersheds in the light of how we regenerate, how we ensure that there are more water retention landscapes, how we make sure that we rebuild water tables and aquifers through specific ecological and technological techniques um, that help us to retain water rather than let it run into the atmosphere and evaporate. So you highlight, among other things, Olivia, that not only is water itself a scarce resource, but it's embedded in a series of decisions we make about planetary sustainability, in effect, and that there is a degree of cooperation that one might hope for that is not only about how to allocate the water itself, but how to preserve these um, broader cycles that replenish the system. Ellen, that goes directly into something I wanted to ask you. Like, it's I don't mean to imply for a moment that in the U.S. we've gotten this completely right or anything like that. But as we think about the global and the domestic and what we might learn from each, say a bit about how water conflict has played out in the U.S. and how among California and its neighbors, for example, there might be something to learn or something to avoid about how we've tried to reconcile interests, however imperfectly, with respect to scarce water resources. So I'll, I'll start by saying it's very much a work in progress <laughs> in California and the and the and the Western U.S. But um, if we compare, you, Tina, you mentioned the Colorado River Basin, which is so. This is a you know one of the one of the continent's major rivers. It um, provides water to seven states and and to Mexico to a couple of states within Mexico. Um, very important ecological resource, very important for agriculture, very important for um, sustaining a lot of urban communities. The back in the 30s, when the, the water was divvied up, it was a it was a wet period. And folks were kind of optimistic that that was what represented reality, um, even before there was really a signal of climate changing there was already a recognition some decades ago that those numbers were wrong and that there was less water than the pie. The pie was smaller than what had been divvied up. Um, and now we see that the pie is shrinking more with the, with the changing climate. The, the good thing I would say is that, you know, whereas some decades ago there were actually, the, the Arizona called in its national guard you know, to, to sort of uh, be on the border with California and get ready for get ready for a fight. Now um, you really see a lot of efforts toward cooperation, and I think um, it's been, you know, communicating uh, broadly about what the nature of the risk is has been important. Um, the federal government has played a really constructive role in kind of forcing people to the table by threatening to take action. And we've seen some really productive agreements um, among the among all the parties, including getting some water back into the, the river delta, you know, had been completely dried up and now sort of water for the ecology, as well as efforts to kind of look to how to manage the system more flexibly, do more groundwater storage, kind of agreements to you know, kind of with the with the notion that if we don't all cooperate, we're all going down. Um, so I think that kind of approach is great. It can't. It's it's not done. It won't be done for ever, probably. But um, kind of forcing for finding ways to force people to the table. Terrific. Well, so here at the Carnegie Endowment, we focus not only on the sources of conflict and the prospects for peace, but also to some extent on the challenges that countries need to work together to solve and maybe that countries can learn from each other in solving. So I want to 
move towards maybe a, a more concrete or, or, or a further concrete set of examples that highlight what the trade-offs are. And I, it may or may not be the case that all of you agree on what to do about this or what would play out. But let me focus on cities for a moment. These cities that have reached zero day or have gotten near reaching zero day, the terminology to highlight, like what happens when the reservoirs for a big city with millions of people come to run dry as uh, appeared to be about to happen in, um, in Cape Town not long ago and, and nearly happened in Chennai. And of course, Ellen, in California, we hear plenty about the possibility that a big city might get close to running out of water. And I guess I want to start by asking the question of what that even means for a big city to run out of water. Because, and here I want to be deliberately contrarian for a moment, right? Uh, one kind of economist, not every kind of economist, one kind of economist would say, well, let's take a look at the math right here. The vast majority of water goes to agricultural uses. What is it like 70 plus percent then like 19 percent goes to um, uh, industry so a, a small fraction of overall water goes to actually quenching the thirst of human beings and you know in a reasonably functioning market there might be some pain here and there but eventually you get some equilibration certainly this kind of economist might point out that some countries like saudi arabia incentivize water conservation saudi arabia's one of many examples of a country facing water stress. So what is right or wrong with that picture? Like at the end of the day, I don't mean to be um, to overly simplify, but I, I want you to sort of highlight what are the nuances in that? How or why is it difficult for these markets to just adjust? Or why can't we simply just slightly titrate the amount of water that goes to meeting human needs directly and simply use technology or better management to deal with the other uses for water? Let me start with you, Stuart, and then I'll have everyone weigh in. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, from a uh, sort of standard mainstream economist would say, look, we, we got to review this through the lens of supply and demand. Um, let's um, introduce trading and or particularly even pricing mechanisms that uh, reflect the true economic value of water and then reduce demand. You know, this is a this is a possible step. It is, however, a, a politically volatile step, particularly when free or cheap access to water is viewed as an inherent and longstanding right. Um, and what's interesting, though, is there needs to be some adjustment because often the people that benefit the most or benefit equally from free water are often the quite well off. So if you had to if you were going to try to treat water as any other commodity, um, you'd, you'd have to take some steps and put in safeguards to avoid hitting the poor too hard. There's, there would be, have to be some adjustment a level for poverty to avoid the backlash because what we saw certainly a couple of decades ago or even more you know with major upheavals in bolivia and other countries is when you try to introduce these price controls and sort of sort of economic rationalization sort of the equivalent of or privatization um, you create um, huge um, political upheaval or you certainly risk it others may be more expert in in how uh, in particular circumstances these sorts of mechanisms could work but that's the, the one danger that i would point to both as a matter of sort of political upheaval, but also as a matter of social justice. Thank you. Zainab? Yeah, so uh, I'll say two things with respect to uh, your question on, um, you know, allocation, right? Basically allocation decisions uh, with respect to water use, water consumption, whether in big cities or in fact, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, settlements. Um, so what makes, even though, of course, water is a natural resource, like other kinds of resources, its use, its management is slightly different. And even the infrastructure around it, uh, you find that compared to, let's say, electricity, you know, power, energy, um, infrastructure around water and sanitation historically um, doesn't always easily confirm to the market mechanisms and market logics that you find with other kinds of resources or other kinds of infrastructure. Uh, again, energy comes to mind. And you find that you know, governments have tried to do that and cost recovery for water services becomes very, very difficult. So in the end, many governments end up providing it as a kind of public service. There's some kind of subsidization that goes on just because it's so difficult to recoup costs. And of course, that then creates its own interesting challenges and dynamics. And of course, then we have the allocation challenges that you mentioned. But then, you know, I also want to think about, you know, other kinds of 
urban settlements beyond big cities, big cities that are upper uh, high income or upper middle income, like uh, you know the, the South African cities you mentioned or the situation in California, where in those cases, actually both residential uh, consumers and also industrial consumers end up supplying or, or coming up with solutions for water use themselves. And what ends up happening in some cases is that they are tapping, they're creating boreholes, right? Which creates environmental challenges as well. So I think, you know, we, we also have to think about um, the kinds of settlements we're, we're talking about. And then the fact that, again, water resources and the infrastructure around them do not always neatly conform to the market logics that we see with other kinds of um, resources, with other kinds of, uh, of infrastructure in cities and urban settlements. Thank you, Zainab. Olivia, your thoughts? Allocation, policy changes, can we solve this through technical expertise? I think um, I'm going to take even one step back and ask whether or not our economic models or market adjustment mechanisms are ecologically smart or not. And if you look back, for example, at the Dasgupta review, which came out, I think, 18 months ago, 24 months ago, um, which was uh, asked for by the UK government, there was a very profound recognition, essentially, that modern economics just don't take into account rates of ecological regeneration. So that means that on the whole, our economic system is degenerative. It forces essentially water scarcification and other types of natural scarcification, which play in our disfavor, especially as we try and you know, mitigate or adapt to climate change. So this is one thing we, we need to sort of understand whether or not market adjustments, if we introduce some, including, you know, stock uh, market trading, for example, over water, if they pursue the, uh, the objective of being ecologically regenerative beyond just being able to allocate resources or adjudicate essentially who gets what kind of resource and over what kind of a mechanism. Regarding urban planning as well, you know, like this is a really complex matter because on the one hand, well, cities across the globe are essentially centers of economic activity and global integration. They uh, are you know, driving the global economy, but they also drive a lot of waste and a lot of ecological depletion from, you know, across the world because of how they develop themselves and expand territorially, which essentially sort of also contributes to water evaporation or inability essentially to retain water in the soils and in ecosystems. But they also force a lot of, uh, sort of water use because of what they import and what they export. So uh, there, there is you know, something that we need to, to think about in terms of the role of cities, for example, not just in terms of the shocks that they may themselves encounter as a result of water scarcity or water depletion, which have a host of different social and political and economic issues, but how cities themselves, again, you know, drive issues around water scarcification and natural resource scarcification. And then there is the last question, which is about economic modeling, which you were touching upon. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to take one simple example to ask whether or not we're ecologically smart. We all know about the Ukraine invasion. We all know how the Ukraine invasion is uh, leading to an offshoot in terms of uh, staple prices, spe specifically wheat. They were already high back in December, even before the Ukraine invasion, but they're now skyrocketing. As a result, the European Union, and particularly the French presidency of the European Union, is arguing for strategic autonomy and strategic sovereignty, including over food production. The rationale is to try and make sure that European Union countries increase production of food through intensive agriculture over the next few years. Intensive agriculture, it's very well known, is terrible for soils and is terrible for water pollution and is terrible for water scarcity. The result is essentially that we're embedding into our own European futures water scarcification. The result is already that we're using technological means to try and solve that problem. So in France, you have, for example, technology, a technology called cloud seeding used at commercial level by French farmers to try and seed clouds with more particles that bring water onto soils. 
But this is essentially trying to chemically induce a change in rainfall patterns rather than try to work with ecology and nature in order to strengthen the way in which nature regeneratively works and therefore you know how our economy needs to adapt um, and adjust uh, partly to the ways in which we need to to feed and strengthen those ecological interdependencies rather than fully rely on technology in order to solve this kind of problem. And I gather, Olivia, one implication of your point is that we're not even just talking about policy changes to better align incentives with costs that people are not internalizing. You're also talking about thinking through the paradigms, the assumptions we make about how we assess social welfare economics. Ellen, your thoughts? So full disclosure here, I, I don't know if anybody else is in, an economist on the, on the panel, but, but that's my, that's my, uh, you know, cardinal a card sharing economist as well. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, and I've done a lot of work on water trading and, um, you know, I think as, as others have, have pointed out, uh, maybe especially Zainab, uh, you know, there, water's different. It's, it's heavy. <laughs> it, because you have scarcity in one place, you might have abundance in another place. You know, get, it, it, sometimes people think, oh, naturally we should just move it there. Um, that can be very costly and make it actually quite expensive to, to, to do that. And moving it around has all kinds of ecological consequences, you know, as, as Olivia and Zainab and, and Stuart have all pointed out. Um, that said, there is a large component of water that is really should really be viewed as an input into production rather than you know there's a basic need component of water people you know you talked about the equity issues and making sure that 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 folks who don't have a lot of resources have access to water they you know that that's a, a piece of policy that has to be there but there's also a large component of water that is a an input into production in the same way that you know fertilizers are that that labor is that machines are and and agriculture you know should be making decisions about use of those of those resources in a, it with some market signals and and so um it's a challenge in places where there's been a long-term subsidy for that water and sometimes it's explicit where the government's paying sometimes it's implicit where people have just been allowed to mine the groundwater basins and basically get the water without realizing how it's, it's real value. Um, and introducing, I, to me, markets are, water markets are an important component, but not, you can't just have a free for all. You've got to have really a good set of regulations and a framework to make sure you're not selling somebody else's water, to make sure that the consequences locally are not impacting you know, other people's wells and things like that. But but there are good examples of, of where it can help incentivize people to use less and it can be better for the local economies. So I'll highlight where, thank you, Ellen, where I hear convergence and where there may or may not be, but probably is a little bit of more divergence in terms of what panelists might emphasize. There, there seems to be convergence that it's hard to imagine the world making effective use of scarce freshwater resources without some market signals, some degree of pressure to allocate it to more efficient or effective uses. You know, and then the, the question becomes where that market framework has to reach its limits, both in terms of protecting the poor, which we might all agree should happen, but then might have differing views about exactly how to do that or where to draw that line. And then maybe also some potentially different perspectives about how much total good the market signals will be able to do without going further and then thinking about these broader questions about the nature of the ecological system and its relationship to the economy that Olivia was raising. So I'll, I'll note that. And now before we go to questions from the audience, let me ask you to imagine another hypothetical. And this is very hypothetical because I don't want to suggest for a moment that we've developed a good framework for dealing with climate change or solved big geopolitical security problems, but just for purposes of our conversation, imagine a coalition between a brand new UN Secretary General, several heads of big philanthropic foundations, a couple of new heads of state, and they all come together and they have a big press conference and they say, 
we've come to the conclusion that the climate stuff is kind of under control. Others can deal with that. And while global conflict continues to rage in a lot of ways, we want to put our focus on water for a moment. We think that's such an important resource for the world that we want to make that really central to what we all do, all our agendas. And you have a chance to advise this group and to tell them to do two things, one or two things max, across all these different levers they have that can most give the world leverage in addressing the challenges we've been dealing with. What would you advise them to do? And I, I, w- I would like to give you all, you know, 10 minutes to think about it and then call on you, but we don't have 10 minutes. So I'm going to have to call on somebody. So let me start with you, Olivia, and then we'll call on the rest. Um, thank you, Tino. I'll, I'll start by just maybe coming back on one simple thing that you said, which is we've decided that climate change is under control. Now we want to focus on water. Um, I'll, I'll start by pointing out that there is a very strong relationship between the breaking of the hydrological cycle and the scarcification of water and the type of uh, climate change disruptions that we're going to see and that we're already seeing. Just a a very simple uh, observation, the majority of the climate disruptions that we're seeing today, drought, inundations or floods and fires are all functions of water, either too much of it or too little. And the more we actually learn to work with the hydrological cycle, the the more we work with the ability to strengthen ecological interdependencies that exist between soils, water, and biodiversity, and the the ecological interdependencies that exist between various world ecosystems, the more we will strengthen or, or, or enhance our chances to adapt properly to climate change and to eventually potentially mitigate climate change. So this is one thing that I'd like to to, uh, start by saying. And so the two things that I'd uh, focus on, which are somewhat already underway under different sort of, you know, uh, discussions regarding like we're we're, uh, in the year of the Kunming uh, Biodiversity Convention negotiation. Um, we're also, you know, in the midst of negotiations around whether or not we protect, you know, 30% of oceans and lands um, regarding biodiversity, which will have some uh, good effects with uh, water conservation. But the thing that I would definitely uh, advise all those heads of states and the UN Secretary General and, you know, all these other people would be to start by working on making sure that complex regeneration is within every single aspect of water diplomacy, conservation, adaptation or climate adaptation uh, regarding uh, climate finance, regarding adaptation and and mitigation, and how we actually sort of um, embed complex regeneration within legal treaties and agreements that Uh, or transboundary in nature or or regional in nature over how to protect um, natural resources. And complex regeneration is very much about trying to make sure that we work with water, try to retain it in the soils, try to sort of, you know, look at ecosystems-based adaptation um, to redesign landscapes for climate disrupted futures, for food productive futures, for water safe futures, and how we make sure that we protect um, uh, ecological uh, systems uh, within international institutions from a legal, socio-economic, and political perspective. Thank you. And yes, Thank just one last thing. Oh, okay, go ahead. Quickly. Um, the notion of complex regeneration is not just that we should protect nature, it's that we should embed essentially the regeneration of natural systems in the way that we rethink socioeconomic systems. So it very much is about piloting new approaches over how to um, change the way in which we do economics and politics and governance and how we embed the the protection of nature and the uh, resilience of human societies in climate disrupted futures. Thank you. Ellen and then Zainab and then Stuart. I'll just have I, your question is is too ambitious for me, Tino. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink it down a little bit to at least a piece of it that I think is part of the puzzle. I would I would say we have to be trying to manage these things at the at the watershed scale, and a lot of times our geopolitical boundaries are cutting watersheds up, and that's a, a big part of the the challenge um, is you know, it, it, people being able to take the water, divert it upstream and not talk to the people downstream, those kind of things. So getting uh, 
fi finding ways to to really get people to to think about this and and incentives to cooperate at the watershed scale. Thank you. It's telling that the notion of upstream and downstream has such a rich metaphorical application, and yet it is a literal thing we're talking about here. And I take your point that in some ways, you know, this sort of uh, hypothetical assemblage of the UN and the foundations and the heads of state have limited power even among at that level of um, capability to redraw the geopolitical boundaries. So they then have to find effective and creative ways to incentivize cooperation across these, these boundaries when they haven't drawn them. Zainab? Great. I think that's a very fascinating question. And it's fascinating because, uh, you know, you start at the UN at the very top. Uh, and, and what we know of, uh, you know, challenges around water scarcity, whether it's tensions, whether it's competition, whether it's outright conflict, are often not the result of water scarcity. They intersect with pre-existing conditions. And what are those pre-existing conditions? At least three things. Number one, at least in the case of Africa and perhaps parts of Asia. Number one, it's historical legacies around state formation. The fact that a lot of these countries have very contested borders as a result of the nature of their colonial creation, right? In Africa, stemming right from the Berlin Conference or Psych Pico, which created a lot of the countries in North Africa, right? So contested boundaries, which then translate into disputes around access to water resources, as we're seeing with respect to GERD in Egypt, uh, GERD in Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, and the riparian countries there. Then what is the second uh, um, uh, pre-existing condition? I would say the challenge of underdevelopment in uh, many parts of uh, the developing world, particularly in Africa. So in the Sahel, for example, another place where you know there are flashpoints, whether it's the Lake Chad Basin or other parts of, of the region, where you have you know very low levels of human development, low uh, high rates of poverty, uh, low productivity high levels of informality, et cetera, which then further drive conflict and tension around access to scarce water resources and, and, and fertile land. And then the third factor per existing condition I would mention would include uh, weak institutions, weak governance capacities. So meaning that, you know, for us to think about viable, sustainable and feasible solutions, we also have to look at, um, what solutions work at the local level within a specific context. Because we've had uh, so many situations where, you know, global initiatives are designed as solutions, but there's just no local uptake. Because in some cases, the design of this global solution does not really speak to specific local challenges that a country or a sub-region faces. So the first thing I would say with respect to thinking about viable solutions is, you know, let's also look at what may work at the local level, what may work at the regional level, what may work at the sub-regional level, and then how to link this to global frameworks of thinking and of analysis. So let's find ways to ensure that there's an intersection between global solutions and their local applicability. I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's gonna be what I would say, would be not a solution, but a framework to arrive in at viable solutions. Thank you, Zainab. Stuart. Thanks, I had to un unmute myself. Um, yeah, I would say um, th uh, two things. Um, the first would be to establish the UN as a more robust focal point for um, global water security. Um, unlike other um, major global issues like uh, nuclear proliferation with the IEA uh, or uh, global health with the WHO, there's really no dedicated multilateral organization that drives water cooperation. You have UN water, which is basically a loose coordinating body that's not really active in the field. I think a long-term goal would be to create an independent UN water agency. Um, but it, it, even in the interim, um, w one can improve um, early warning and mediation mediation efforts at the United Nations. Um, I think that there, have to, there has to be an effort to try to integrate sort of water scarcity and water conflict into models of state fragility um, that the UN and, and, and its member states can plug into. I think there should be <clears throat> a stable of special envoys um, that are ready to help mediate such disputes. Um, 
uh, which um, obviously has been a big interest of uh, Antonio Gutierrez uh, in his time at uh, as, as Secretary General. The other issue, I think, would be to try to pioneer new legal approaches to water disputes. I'm not a lawyer, Tino, you are, but uh, I know that right now the International Court of Justice is a venue that sometimes has countries come and, uh, and, and seek peaceful redress for some of their disputes. Uh, Chile and, and Bolivia are about to do one in, in April. A more flexible option might be for UN Water or under the auspices of UN Water to establish an international water dispute settlement body. But uh, in parallel with that, something we haven't talked in as much about is this question of shared aquifers. And there has been discussion within the UN General Assembly of, um, of a potential international legal instrument on transboundary aquif aquifers, which enjoy even less formal governance uh, than shared river basins. So that might be something to look at too as well. But I'll stop there. I have more, but uh, I, I, I know we all do. <laughs> this fits nicely into a question, uh, to some extent, touches on a question from the audience. And it goes to how a lot of our discussion has been about the shorter term and the longer term. Obviously, we can all sketch out at some level of generality what the framework would be for dealing with this in different parts of the world over a long period of time, assuming responsibility and sensibility and decision making. But the shorter term is trickier. And we think about mayors, for example, dealing with water scarcity in big cities, governors, national leaders, international leaders. And so that gives rise to this question from the audience of how political leaders who are experiencing water emergencies might reconcile the need for an immediate solution, often one that might require reliance on water reservoirs or finite resources with the sustainable long-term stuff that Olivia is talking about, for example. Oh, sorry, is that directed to me or to? Yeah. Well, let, why don't we start with you, Stuart, and then I want to ask Ellen, and uh, we'll see if others want to jump in. I mean, these, <clears throat> it's interesting. These trade-offs are often um, uh, quite common in, in the development enterprise as well, too. Um, it's the sort of trade-off between giving fish versus uh, teaching folks to fish. Um, and um, so, yeah, there, there, there are immediate priorities. At the same time, you're trying to build an entire new, more efficient water infrastructure system. Um, you, you obviously... I mean, to use that another metaphor, sort of flying the plane as perhaps you're cannibalizing its parts as well. Um, it, it, there's no, I think, easy, um, uh, easy answer to that. One possibility would be to ch channel a, a vastly larger um, uh, amount of uh, adaptation resources. Um, we, you know, the international community has fallen behind on climate, climate adaptation funding not even getting up to $100 billion a year that it's been promised for a long time. But it would strike me that at least to try to help countries um, uh, maybe invest in the longer term things, even as they have to, in effect, uh, eat some of their seed corn, I think um, at least that would be a, a potential bridging solution um, to at least suggest that there is going to be investment coming to try to help um, countries with those short term uh, challenges. For instance, we, we mentioned cities before. There's something like 30 to 50 percent water wastage in many cities around the world. And that's that's a really good example of where, you know, if you could actually plug those holes, literally, <laughs> you would actually be able to um, to uh, reduce the um, the immediate drain on um, on, on, on water resources and, and make sure that they're used more efficiently. I'm sure uh, some of our other speakers have more enlightened views uh, for your question. That's good. Ellen, uh, balancing short term and long term. So, you know, I, I was what came to mind immediately with that question is never let a good crisis go to waste. You know, that's I, I don't know. It was it Rahm Emanuel. Yeah, it Emanuel used to say that in public and in private. <laughs> um, so and, I, and I'm, I'll, I'll look, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the Colorado River and, you know, I, you can sort of see this in within California, too. Um, we had a, a terrible drought in 1976-77. It was short-lived, but very acute. And it was outside the bounds of any of the models that the system had been built on. And so, you know, it, it, it hit and water managers were like, whoa, uh, you know, what, what do we do here? We actually, uh, near where I live, the, there was a county, Marin County, that had no water. They were running out of water. There was a pipe put on a bridge to send water from where the, the this side where I live to over across the bridge to Marin emergency method. You know, it was very much a sort of a day zero kind of, you know, Cape Town day zero kind of scenario. That was in the late seventies. 
again, hit with a big drought, late 80s to early 90s. And San Diego was afraid of running out of water. Um, you know, major city, over a million people. What that prompted, and it was not just, you know, it was water managers themselves, communities, but also state government, sort of a, a, some planning rules that came into place, some incentives that came into place, but also just a, a real motivation to look for kind of longer term solutions. So in the, the very near term in the crisis, you do what, you know, you put the pipe over the bridge or, you know, you do you do sort of the, those short term things that don't look like they're very smart fixes. But then if you if you take that as a wake up call to do the kind of planning for sustainability, it puts you in a much better place. And I think especially if that's done with the philosophy of it needs to be sustainable and we have to take into account you know, the ecosystem and not just, you know, grabbing what, somebody else's water, um, that, can, that can be helpful. Thank you. I'm going to ask the next question, maybe ask Olivia and Stuart to comment on this, anybody else who wants to. And it highlights just the practical, in some sense, really dramatic reality that equitable, sustainable, enforceable water sharing agreements might run into just the reality of countries not wanting to honor those agreements. And so this question was asked, particularly in the context of China-India water flows, how we might incentivize China, for example, to uphold agreed upon water flows to India. So Olivia, Stuart. Um, so I'm not a China-India expert. I'll start by saying this. Um, but learning from other contexts, um, I think that we should take into account the fact that fairly often transboundary water management is made on the premise of how do you share a, a, a resource which is indeed growing scarcer and scarcer without necessarily questioning the premise of how can we reverse scarcity? Can we? And if so, how? And how can we do it collectively? So um, Ellen, you were mentioning at some point earlier, you know, like we see that the, sh the pie is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And in any type of negotiation or political mediation, there is this metaphor that says, rather than try to divide the pie, try to grow the pie. And with water, there is a sense that it may be possible, as I was saying, through a, a bunch of different techniques, including complex regeneration, ecological design, hydrological re retention, and things that Ellen and other experts, you know, are, are uh, probably, you know, much more expertly knowledgeable about. So the question is, first and foremost, uh, how do we understand what is driving essentially the enmity between China and India? Um, and this is not going to be just curtailed to uh, water per se? And how can we over time essentially sort of propose some frameworks for um, cooperation that help to uh, work cooperatively towards regeneration? And that may include essentially working over water and uh, techniques that help to increase the flow of water rather than just divide it, but also pull together other resources. How do they cooperate over agricultural outputs? How do they cooperate on other type of economic sectors? So it's also growing the pie in terms of what are the different economic activities that impact water that can be thought of as potentially cooperative, um, you know, in, in partnership between China and India and other partners as well that help indirectly with water regeneration and regeneration cycles um, on top of being uh, legally enshrined into how these two countries cooperate over specific uh, common watersheds. Thank you. Stuart? Yeah, <clears throat> this is a very difficult um, um, problem. And I see that uh, it's my friend Jay Oki, uh, who has asked the question. Uh, good, to, good to get that question, Jay, always asking the difficult questions. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult because um, there's not going to be any external mediation that's going to be accepted uh, by and large. The, the two countries are have a neuralgic resistance to internationalizing uh, many disputes, um, India, Pakistan, etc. Um, so I think that the best that you can uh, hope for uh, early on is to, is to have a certain lowering of the temperature, um, particularly along uh, the lines uh, uh, in the Himalayas where the, the two countries are, you know, basically at bayonet points with one another. I think you could imagine as uh, picking up what Olivia said, seeing whether or not there, there are particular shared commercial interests in trying to, as you said, enlarge the pie, or at least suggest that, you know, that this, that this crisis or this, um, 
this challenge presents an opportunity, perhaps an economic opportunity. Um, you know, India has been resistant uh, on some of the Belt and Road um, aspects of, um, of what China has been doing and has been fearing that. But it's possible that um, you could imagine some joint ventures that um, are can, could be a boon for you know electricity generation in both countries, for instance. Um, but it, confidence building mechanisms too, where there's actual data sharing about um, you know um, you know uh, water water releases, uh, so there's not flooding in in uh, northern India. Enough confidence that there would be. Um, um, you know, silt being delivered, as I, as I mentioned, from from these rivers. Um, but I think that this the negotiation um, is going to um, be um, highly tricky. Similar to which we haven't mentioned um, the Mekong River, uh, where China's building of dams, rampant building of dams, with lots of ec ecological degradation uh, on the upstream. Um, portions of that river are um, of, of deep, deep um, concern to the four uh, downstream riparian um, uh, nations. So no easy solution, I think, for, uh, for, for this particular confrontation. We're almost out of time. I wonder if uh, you all might take 30 seconds and try to do no more than 30 seconds, just sketching out what you most hope for in a nutshell to see 20 years out. If we go 20 years into the future and imagine having dealt with this problem effectively, what what do you imagine will be part of the day-to-day -day of how we manage water? Ellen, let's start with you. I hope that we get to a place where we can manage water more cooperatively, more flexibly, and only use it where it really, where we really need to. Thank you. Zainab? Um, well, I hope we get to a place where we recognize uh, the importance of water to begin with and how it uh, intersects with other pre-existing challenges and how it shapes them. Uh, I also hope we get to a place where uh, the solutions we come up with take into account um, you know, local initiatives, um, that uh, those local initiatives are also uh, you know, embedded in uh, uh, national, perhaps regional uh, governance and institutional frameworks to ensure that those solutions are sustainable down the line. We have seen a number of initiatives, a number of uh, treaties, uh, a number of global uh, proposals for solutions not make much headway because uh, they have not taken into account those local dynamics. So those would be the two, two things I would mention. Thank you. Olivia. I suppose uh, at different levels, at international levels, I'd like to see a world where indeed we've identified very precisely the type of ecosystems that are responsible for water cycling and hydrological cycling, so the distribution of water across the globe, and we've protected them legally as well as economically. From a country level perspective, I'd like to see uh, a world in which we have integrated within our frameworks for how we do economic output and economic modeling, regenerative guidelines. So how do we make sure that our activities, I'll take the example of agriculture, how we shift away from intensive agriculture only to more complex systems that feed the soils as much as they take away from soils and therefore help with water retention. Private sector level, we need to have uh, some business models that have integrated the use of natural resources within the way in which they function and therefore have a pricing mechanism or business models that reflect that. And finally, at local levels, it's also about empowering the type of governance and dialogue systems or uh, inclusive governance that indeed helps to do complex regeneration where it's needed and um, shift very ever so slightly the ways in which we use natural resources um, and how we do cooperate operation as, as, uh, as was mentioned before. Thank you. Stuart? <clears throat> yes, I think we should try to, uh, the best thing would be to try to marry um, our appreciation of the contribution of water scarcity to state fragility with a natural capital approach um, to remedies, uh, picking up on some of Olivia's uh, really good points. Um, I think that um, as I mentioned, that you know, when I was at the State Department, um, and a couple of decades ago, we worked with the CIA to come up with an instability watch list of various indicators of state fragility. We didn't look at environmental degradation or water security as variables, and I think that needs to change in informing, you know, fragility assessments, uh, not just within the U.S. government, but across um, the 
um, the international multilateral system. And I think that then when you look towards remedies, um, thinking about it in terms of, of preserving um, ecosystems, including rivers, um, and um, that, 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 so, that, so that humans are actually not working across purposes with nature and, and you know, water resources in, in particular, but are actually um, the, that the remedies are those that are involved in, in restoring and using nature's natural resilience. Um, so I'd like to see that. Thank you, Ellen, Olivia, Zainab, and Stewart for a stimulating discussion and for helping us make Water Day count, for exploring some of our possible futures and what water tells us about the world. We hope for our viewers, you'll stay engaged with us and you'll keep on thinking about how the political and economic choices we make shape the global water agenda and global peace and security. Thank you and to be continued.